On this episode of Star Trek Universe, we are discussing Strange New Worlds 105, Spock Amok, right after these very important words from our mystery sponsors. Amok, 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 amok. Amok you. There. Star Trek Universe podcast, where you get to listen to lifelong friends talk about Star Trek. My name is Matthew Carroll. I am David C. Robertson. <laughs> I thought it was over. I thought I got through it. I, I, for those of you just joining us, which is all of you, I've been sitting here hacking up my lungs because I was eating a breakfast burrito. And I guess an egg or piece of sausage went down the wrong pipe. Uh-huh. And I've been sitting here coughing and trying to like compose myself to podcast. Uh-huh. And as soon as we said uh, we said our hellos, I'm like, <clears throat> <clears throat> so yeah. hopefully there won't be too much more of that in the podcast. And what there will be, I'll try to edit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, I fell asleep on the couch uh, in the living room uh, last night. And uh, I wake up to our cat going, huh, 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 oh, huh. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, yeah. it's like I can't get away from people hacking and vomiting yeah. all over the you, place. You fell asleep again this afternoon, then woke up and got on the cast instead of the couch and then a mat instead of a cat. Uh-huh. I thought I like yeah. parallels mat, cat. sliding doors stuff going on. Yeah. And you too are afraid of vacuum cleaners. And that's true. That's true. <laughs> You've seen my house. <laughs> Mentioning sliding doors and parallels, I have to mention just for the audience here. Go see everything everywhere all at once. Just go. It's uh, don't even watch a trailer, don't care, like just go. It's the best. It's the best. It's the best freaking movie I maybe have ever seen. It's so good. I yeah, I would like to see it. I got your text too late. Yeah, I know. I, I texted <laughs> Dave the other night when me and my buddy Gary were going. And I was like, hey, we're going at 920. And he texted me at 1030. Do you have a time machine or whatever? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Help me locate my time machine. All right. Well, let's talk about this Strange New Worlds episode. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. Lots of hijinks. Oh, God. <laughs> that was like my least favorite thing about the episode, probably. What? I'll, I'll get to it, but look, I, I love how each episode so far has focused on a different character. Yeah, and I feel like Discovery could learn something from this show. Like <laughs> they are already succeeding where Discovery has taken you know four years and not done nearly as well in mm-hmm. developing their characters. I, I, I'd push back a little bit. I mean, I, I think I think I agree with you. They don't do it as well as quickly. But I mean, mm-hmm. like, I think there are a number of well-developed characters on Discovery. I know that we we kind of joke about, and and it's somewhat true. I think they don't do it; they're not doing it as well as they do it here. But um, you know, uh, Stamets, for instance, is a character that I really care about. Culver's a character that I really care about. I don't know a lot of the uh, Tilly. They're, they've they've done a good job, but it's taken four years. Yeah, and like I do think they're doing it much quicker and more intentionally here. Mm-hmm. Partially because they don't seem to be trying to build a season long arc. Really, it's it's like th- there may be some season long stuff that happens, especially character mm-hmm. arcs. Mm-hmm. There's not a galactic ending threat that that's on on its way, and I think this is where yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's just where Star Trek thrives. Like I, I don't know. It, I, I dig it a lot. I mean, yeah, I I don't know. Um, loving the dream sequence on Vulcan. That was pretty perfect. As far as I could tell, it looks like they took the set from a muck time yep. from the regional series and just just put it there and gave it cinematic lighting instead of that like perfect even television lighting from the eight uh, from the sixties. Yeah, and uh, I was very impressed with that. Like to me, that was you know part of the thing where I was like, this is what I've been talking about, where you could just grab that aesthetic and light it a little differently, and and suddenly it looks dope as shit dude yeah great great moment i was really even i was <laughs> like the vulcan people standing there with their you know their i can't i don't even know what they're called um bethany called them the doing it bells 
it's like it's the doing, doing it bells. bells. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. like the little like the little racks where they like shake it and the bells go. Ding, 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 ding. Yep. D- during, yeah, during the marriage ceremony or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, it's them doing it bells. <laughs> And then later when Topring and Spock are in their quarters, they have bells that they ring. And she's like, it's more doing it, bells. <laughs> I just think that was funny. That's great. I, I was going to say that, you know, it makes just you could call them wedding bells, you know. That's, nope. That's doing, doing it, doing. bells. It's wedding ceremony bells. But, you know, those ones in the bedroom are definitely doing it, bells. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, it's doing it. And is uh, now doing it, you know, Vulcan very... Uh, complex race, you know. If it's a wedding, then yeah, maybe they're wedding bells, but they're also doing it bells. Mm-hmm. And then, like, and you're in the bedroom, it's definitely doing it bells. Depends on the pitch you're ringing. It's like Chinese, where it's it's a pitch right. language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you know, uh, you back to the planet surface, and now it's time to call Califi, and that's going to be uh fighting bells and then fighting bells mm-hmm. but that's still kind of doing it bells yeah you're doing it you're getting down to it go with the nike aesthetic <laughs> you're slitting some throats <laughs> all right so yeah I, I i i don't know you you said you didn't like the hijinks i, I liked the I, I even like the line about the hijinks but i i liked the the fact that this episode is pretty uh there, there's no danger really in this episode i mean there's the no uh how many episodes have we had of star trek lately that haven't had the danger of death you know what i mean uh-huh. and like you know even even in all the series a lot of times they have to have that moment of like oh but watch out now something's gonna now the the game we've been playing is going to kill everybody if we don't solve right. it this was just right. like you know and i understand there was the threat of you know this race not joining the federation but like that mm-hmm. was kind of treated pretty lightly you know it wasn't yeah it wasn't treated as like uh an existential threat i just i don't know it just made it an enjoyable episode yeah when i say hijinks like i'm i specifically just don't really care for freaky friday for that trope oh yeah and there's only been like one time that i liked that trope and that was on justice league unlimited Mm. when um when flash and lex luthor swapped and flat and lex luthor is like well on the bright side, I can at least find out the true identity of the Flash. And he goes over to the mirror and takes off the mask and goes, I have no idea who this is. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, I don't know. I guess I don't have a connection or a, you know, a, a version to that trope. Uh, but... I, uh, I, you know, I enjoyed it here. I thought it was used to good effect, like in the mm-hmm. relationship, but also in the, um, you know, like whatever, making the hijinks of like to Pring trying to solve Spock's thing and Spock trying to solve to Pring's thing with very little knowledge or the skill set to do so, you know, made them both yep. respect each other. I, I connected with the entire idea of just like, um, trying to make a relationship better by really seeing through each other's eyes. I think. It was done in a, like a very light and silly way here, but like I dug it. Yeah, and they didn't do it poorly. It wasn't a bad uh, Freaky Friday. Yeah, I thought it was okay, I, and it was an enjoyable episode. I, I didn't have any real big problems with the episode, honestly. We we always call it a Freaky Friday situation, and that's like, where does this concept come from? Surely Freaky Friday isn't the first to do it. I, like, I don't know. Surely there's like an older science fiction <laughs> or like 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 I don't know. Like a Greek uh, uh, myth or something. Like I, I feel like this has got to be like an idea from the past. Is if Probably. Freaky Friday really came up with it, <laughs> like that's very impressive. <laughs> no, no, I don't think they did. But ho- hold on, I'll, I'll look. I'll look. When did Freaky curious. Friday come out? <laughs> okay, okay. But, well, this is a Star Trek so- uh, 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 show. All right. The original oh. film came out in 1976, which means we should be referring to it as a Turnabout Intruder. Because okay. the original series did it before Freaky Friday did it. Well, there you go. So we'll tar- we'll call it a Turnabout Intruder, which is not fair because I hate Turnabout Intruder. It's a terrible episode. <laughs> oh no, it's it's funnier and clearer to call it Freaky Friday. I just uh, I was just curious um, like where that came, like where that trope comes from, like where in yeah. in media or or literature that was first used. I mean, I doubt Turnabout Intruder was the first to do it. I, right. 
Me too. I feel like I'm not remembering a Twilight Zone episode or something, you know? Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's got to be in literature somewhere too. And I'm just not, it's not in my, it's not, not, not in my cultural, uh, Rolodex in my brain. Back before turnabout intruder swapping bodies meant something different. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Key parties. <laughs> Key parties all day. Woo! But uh, what'd you think of the signing the scorch storyline? It was fine. I I meant to like go back and um pause it to see if there were any names I recognized. Like oh yeah, you know so you know anybody from the cage or anything. But I actually did really enjoy. The the Enterprise Bingo story. Yeah, me too. I liked that Laon and Una are uh, just not the type who like to go on shore leave. They like to be on the ship. Right. And we've talked about it a little bit, the idea that those two mm-hmm. uh, have the, that storyline in, like a, I guess, second or third episode where they they kind of have this reason to hate each other. Um mm-hmm. and but they decided in that episode not to. We've been talking about how maybe that would rear its head as as more antagonism, but no, in this episode they're really becoming closer friends because they have that similarity of they're the type that doesn't want to be a part of the party, so they'll sit alone or sit together and be each other's friends. Yeah. And I, I dug that. I think that's very realistic and very true to life. And, you know, seeing them trying to uh have a little fun. Although they did good cop, bad cop wrong. Uh-huh. Good cop, bad cop is when you go in, one of you acts like a mean person, and one of you acts like a good person, so the person in front of you turns to the good person who's reasonable and talks to them, and they're uh-huh. willing to give more information because they see the threat of the other person. Yeah. But they separated them in two separate rooms and just they said, yeah, I, they, I get good cop, I get bad cop. And then they interrogated different suspects. That's not how good cop, bad cop works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think they like, wound up swapping at some point I, as well. Did they? But maybe I not. I don't know. I don't, I don't think don't know. so. I think they like, I think they combined the whole thing into one room. But yeah. like, they just, I think they did good cop, bad cop wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they did swap. If Enterprise Bingo is just a list of things you have to do, that's also not bingo. It's <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, at least that's a thing in the parlance. Like, we call it like, oh, this wasn't on my pandemic bingo card. And it's like uh-huh. you know, a thing we weren't expecting or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it makes sense though that like Star Trek writers wouldn't know how to play games. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's just not true. What? It's like mm, beep beep boop boop. We don't know what good cop bad cop is. Boop boop. We do <laughs> not know what bingo is. We have never had friends. Oh, <laughs> that's how Star Trek fans are, right? Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Good. And they're robots. Sorry, robots. This is a really good strategy for reaching out to the new listeners. <laughs> right. They're, like Star Trek fans are basically like, you know, less social dot fives. For sure. Just sitting around, blowing their nose, pushing up their glasses. Listen, as someone who's deeply, <laughs> deeply involved in geek culture, <laughs> Star Trek fans are exactly the kind of people who know how to play games, though. Mm. I mean, like, they're the ones who read the rule books and teach other people to play games. <laughs> mm. But not like cool games. Oh yeah, like bingo. <laughs> right. <laughs> like old people game. No. <laughs> it's like we're just conceding that like old people are cooler than us. Our generation yeah. really went down yeah. on the cool spectrum. I think yeah, there's man. something to be said for that. I think I think it's true. We stopped caring about that. Like our generation and and the, you know the ones subsequent to us, are, you know, I mean we say it all the time like geek culture is now pop culture. Um, the idea of being like really into like geeky shit is now like way more cool, uh, way more accepted, mm-hmm. way more like honored in our culture than like, you know, being a cool guy in a leather jacket who rides a motorcycle or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> I don't know. I think at a certain point, like certain things. Like, if you're, like, a Star Wars fan or a Marvel fan and you say, like, I'm a Star Wars geek, I'm a Marvel geek, that's mainstream. You're not a geek anymore. It's over. And you're one of the cool it depends, kids. Uh, it depends. Like, there are there are actual Star Wars geeks and Marvel geeks who are really into uh-huh. the deep lore of it. They, they, they like the comics or whatever. They like the original trilogy. Yeah. They really dig into that old stuff. But then, yeah, 
Uh, but I mean, I mean, you could say the same thing about Star Trek. I, I've met people lately no. who love Star Trek. Yeah, no, I've pe- met people lately who love Star Trek, and all they've seen is 2009 Star Trek. Oh, isn't that strange? I met someone that a, is few, weird. a few months ago. I was talking to him. He was like, oh, I love Star Trek. I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, what? I, you know, that question, what Star Trek do you like? Because it can really be a, a, a key into like what kind of geek you are into this. And he was like, oh, man, the, uh, yeah, the new one, the 2009 movies. Like the, or like he didn't call him that. He just called him like, you know, the Chris Pine, like that, the new movies. Yeah. And I was like, weird. I feel like you're a unicorn, sir. But there are those, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah. not, not that that makes that person a uh, pop culture. <laughs> like That's not pop culture either yet. Or like not the biggest pop culture. It will be one of those things. And it, I, I, I hate to say it, but it's going to happen. And I don't even hate those movies. I enjoy those movies. Um, but it will. You remember when we were coming up. And everybody hated the Star Wars prequels. Sure. Right. And, but now, you know, a lot of people. That's their Star Wars. Like, that's, that was their Star Wars. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, that was theirs. And they're just like, oh, yeah, whatever. Original trilogy. Prequels. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, it's bizarre. But, like, that's what's going to happen with Star Trek, the JJ Trek or Kelvin verse or whatever we want to call it. Sure. Sure, um, absolutely. Where people are like, I don't know nothing about that Bill Shatner bullshit, but Chris Pine, that's my Star Trek. Well, see, I don't know. I mean, yes, there will be people like that. And I, I, I met one the other day, but I don't know that it will ever be like a big. <laughs> you can just, just, like, no, those people, I don't know that those people will exist. Well, you just met one, Matt. What I mean is that's a huge <laughs> trend in Star Wars. Like, it's a big mm-hmm. trend shifting yeah. towards that. Uh, as the people who grew up with those movies age into, you know, being the talking heads on various podcasts right. and stuff. Um, but <laughs> not anything of note, just <laughs> assholes on the Internet talking. Yeah. I mean, f- <laughs> the, the fan culture, you know, like yeah, I'm hearing yeah. more and more of that in the fan culture stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel like the problem with culture right now is it all moves so fast. So as much mm-hmm. as I think those movies are good, and I think there are people who loved them, and there were people who even, like, that was their entry into Star Trek, mm-hmm. I don't know that those movies, they weren't the cultural moment that the Star Wars prequels were, you know? Yeah, they weren't. They weren't. They didn't last as long as in our minds. Even when people, you know, thought Phantom Menace was just okay, they were still incredibly excited for Episode 2, because they, everyone mm-hmm. wanted to know the backstory for... The Empire. Everyone was fine to be disappointed. <laughs> yep. I've always enjoyed Star Wars. I, I talked about this a lot lately because I've been doing Obi-Wan watches over on the Star Wars Universe podcast. And uh, I've been watching Clone Wars and uh, I just watched, I just been watching Obi-Wan. I, Obi-Wan is my Star Wars. Man, that's, that's so much better than any other Star Wars I've ever seen. <laughs> Uh, the best thing I've ever seen of Star Wars is literally just Bill Burr like ranting at that Admiral and Mandalorian and then blowing his brains out. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep. That's pretty. That's pretty great. That's it. That's all I need. I don't ever have to watch another Star Wars anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. That's that's pretty great. I like parts of the Mandalorian okay pretty well, and I like uh, yeah. That I really that's that's probably most. And I like the Mandalorian parts of Boba Fett. But Obi Wan mm-hmm. has been my favorite thing Star Wars has probably yeah. ever done. I'm really liking Obi Wan a lot. I, I really do. I like Timothy Oliphant from from um, yeah from the Mandalorian and Boba Fett. Uh, yeah, I like yeah. that guy. Yeah, he was he was great. I haven't really watched a lot of any of it. I'm just kind of floating through and mm-hmm. sitting down and eating a salad or eating a piece of pizza while my wife watches it and then moving on to the next thing. Right. <laughs> Catching bits and pieces, not really yeah. like watching it all. I've seen it all. Um, and I've recently watched most of clone wars and you know, I still just feel it's still not my fandom. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. but I, I think that Obi-Wan is like the best for me. It's the best show they've done because it's just so they've act, they're actually like making a show where I care about the character. Like mm-hmm. he's a character that like has a great failure in his past, the failure of Anakin, yeah. and they're like really making him a character on the show instead of just being like, "Hey, it's Star Wars. You should like it because it's Star Wars." Like it looks yeah. like. Doesn't this look like Star Wars? Like that's how I feel like about most of the Star Wars I've seen. Um, 
it's like fine storylines and it just looks like star wars <laughs> i want him to be like so traumatized by the past with anakin that he literally has like a fake anakin in his uh in his like pad or whatever he's yeah. like he talks to and he calls it mannequin <laughs> and it's like it's just, it's just like he's going nuts you know that's a little further than they go but uh it's it, not not too much he's pretty scarred he's pretty like like lonely and he's pretty like uh regretful of the past i, I i'm digging it a lot like uh, yeah i mean i do want to watch all that stuff i i want to get to it eventually yeah I Maybe would, I will. you know, if you, if you want, like, they're so out of time with each other and don't like cross over. Mm-hmm. I, I think if you just wanted to jump in and watch Obi-Wan, like you don't, I'm sure watch, you definitely don't need to watch Mando or Boba Fett. They all happen after the original trilogy. Anyway. I, uh, I watched the, the majority of an episode the other night. Oh, and it was, Obi-Wan? it was yeah, of Obi-Wan. It was captivating. Yeah. It's really good. It really was. I just kind of popped in and I was like, oh, okay. Let's see what's going on. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of all that and just like the idea that culture moves so fast. We're talking about that with the with the Star Trek movies versus the Star Wars movies yeah. and different cultural moments. Like I really wonder how much of this Star Trek is going to be indelible to us, to even to us who are talking about it every week, you know? Like mm-hmm. I like it, but it's it it's almost like I am I'm gorging myself on Star Trek, you know? Like it's every yeah. week. It's all the time. There's no like waiting for the next thing. I remember, you know, as a kid, you're like Something happens on TNG, and you're like, "Oh my gosh!" You know, Lore just <laughs> Lore just captured them at that uh, Power Ranger station. You know, mm-hmm. um, and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, that wh- what's going to happen?" It's like six months before I find out. You know, and it's like this big wait, and like, yeah. I, so I remember thinking about that episode for six months and waiting to hear what happens. You know, and like, yeah, it's it's a strange thing now because it's like I can't. Sit, I, there's nothing to sit and wait on, you know? And I mean, that still happens between seasons, yeah. but I'm, I'm on to the next show. I'm talking about the next Star Trek. And it, it, I'm wondering mm-hmm. if it will all feel a little more disposable um, than the things of the past that, that you, you know, waited. I mean, and that's the thing. Geek culture is pop culture. So we just, we used to wait on these things for years in between. And now they're mm-hmm. just like another Star Wars, another Marvel, another Star Trek all the time. And, now you're just kind of soaking in it. You're living in it. And I really, uh, I'm enjoying it immensely, but it also, yeah. um, you know, I, I wonder the uh, psychological effects of thinking back on this time period of Marvel and Star Trek and Star Wars and being like, mm-hmm. yeah, what, what was discovery about? I don't remember. Or like, you know what I mean? I can see that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. I know that like strange new worlds, for instance, and I'm not coming down on strange new worlds. I'm not, I'm really not. Right. But watching Strange New Worlds, knowing that it's a prequel, that it happens before TOS, supposedly in the timeline, and already having seen some of the little like things in Discovery with Spock and everything, I found because I was I was just I was curious because I really wanted to go back and rewatch Arena with the Gorn. I watched that and I watched uh, What Are Little Girls Made Of, which is a Chapel heavy episode of the original series, and to my surprise, I found that strange new worlds and discovery had absolutely no bearing on anything in that episode in those episodes for me like i sat there and watched it as if those shows had not happened as if they didn't take place and even found myself wondering i wonder what their past looked like like <laughs> yeah no you've seen like it. it's just there's like a disconnect for me and that might be just because i'm an old geek I'm almost 40 and I grew up on the original series and I always thought like, I wonder what that looks like. And I'm not seeing the connect between strange new worlds and the original series. So like, just because I, maybe it's just because it's new, uh, you know, maybe it's because I, in some part of my brain, I don't consider it part of the same actual universe. Right. There's like some sort of like, but, and I, it, it might just be because it's new. I don't know. Because when I watch the original series, I still don't think of Enterprise, mm. like coming before it at all. Like I'm just like, yeah, there's because when you watch like those old episodes of the original series, like you know, there's it sound like the way they talk about stuff outside of the Federation. It's like Firefly, dude. It's like <laughs> yeah, and stuff in the past. It's like oh my god, that sounds so primitive and weird. 
So, you know, it's uh, there's some kind of disconnect for me, and it might just be because original series is what I knew first, and sure. I think I might just... There might be, a, like, a disconnect for me after DS9. Like, I think somewhere around the end of DS9 is where I just go, like, I don't really remember stuff from Star Trek after that. <laughs> to answer your question, like... <laughs> Man, that's a that's a ways I'll, back. <laughs> I'll watch it and I'll enjoy it, or I won't. But I'll well see, and that's what I'm. I don't remember it. That's you what know, I'm wondering well. like I, I think that, and and this is particularly pronounced with Strange New Worlds because I don't think it's supposed to be the show you think of as like this epic. It's not an epic so far, at least. It's very much uh-huh. a episodic show that feels like you can throw it on and enjoy it. Which is mm-hmm. what TNG is to me, you know, like, or a lot yeah. of DS9 is to me. Like, I can turn on any episode at any point in the run and enjoy it. Um, uh-huh. DS9 for me, there's like the, the Dominion War stuff that is very important. But even the Dominion mm-hmm. War stuff, they do a good job of keeping it episodic enough that I'm just like, I'm going to throw this on and watch it anytime. And that's part mm-hmm. of the reason I remember it is because I've seen those episodes a lot of times. Right. I, I think they're trying for that with Strange New World. Discovery does not feel that way at all. It feels like you need to sit down and watch a season of this and to uh-huh. really understand what, you know, all the characters are going through and their emotional states and stuff. And that's just not what this show is. And I, I'm excited about that. I think that this could be that thing that we like, re- we could rewatch over and over. But the problem is there could be, it seems that uh, there, there was news this week that they're like really tr- planning to have something come out every week on Paramount plus of Star Trek. Yeah, And so I'm like, when will I rewatch this stuff? When will I feel hunger for Star Trek again? Where when, like, Lord? When? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which, and I don't want to feel hunger for Star Trek. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to be in it all the time, but it makes me wonder about the connection I will draw to these episodes when I don't need to revisit them. When it's just like, oh, that's Star Trek that passed through. It's like, it's like passed through me Star Trek food, you know? Yeah. I love the idea of a Star Trek fan who is sitting around complaining that they're hungry for star trek and then when they get nothing but star trek they say i i miss the hunger <laughs> see and but, no, you know no, no no absolutely and that's why i'm saying but, like i'm not unhappy that it's here at all i'm very happy that it's here i'm wondering about how it affects my enjoyment and how it affects my thinking of these things as epic like thinking of these yeah. things as like the biggest thing going on in media right now for me. I mean, uh, I even felt that way with like Doctor Who a few of those seasons. Like when the 50th anniversary you know. stuff happened and they had like three doctors interacting and it's like all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is huge. This is so cool and huge. And I haven't felt that way lately. And now there are shows yeah. uh, like Moon Knight re- recently, <laughs> like at the end of Moon Knight, I cared immensely about what was happening internally in that mm-hmm. show. And even Discovery, I cared a lot about the 10C, but I'm wondering, like, what will I, will I think back on that season as something that was, like, a moment in my life that I remember? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. that's a, more of a philosophical discussion that I'm sure will continue. Let me run back to uh, Amok Time and quote Spa or paraphrase Spock, uh, <laughs> wanting is not so pleasurable thing after all as having. Or yeah. having is not a not so pleasurable thing as wanting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wonder, wonderful line. That's a way we could look at it with Star Trek. Like, oh god, we have Star Trek every week. I kind of miss not having it for a minute. Um, giving us a yeah. break. I, I do, I do really enjoy, it. and that's what Marvel's been doing lately. Is like for a while they did it every week. There was something, and they started yeah. doing these like two months off, and then you come back to a show, and I'm like. I like Miss Marvel starts this week and I haven't had anything Marvel in a month. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Miss Marvel, let's do it. Let's find out what Miss Marvel's about. I think, I think there's a part of me that's like, you know, we have all these shows like Doctor Who, like you mentioned, we have Star Trek now doing this again. Uh huh. We have Marvel, we have all this stuff. And I really just, I, I feel like these things will never end. Because they're all franchises, and I, I, I'm like Data now in Picard season one. I'm I long for death. You know, <laughs> I just want I just want closure and an ending. I yeah. want the end of the story, and then no more. 
a part of me, you know? Right. Like- <laughs> well, and, and I, think, I think you can get that. They did that with Marvel. And I'm, uh-huh. I'm really appreciative of what they did with Endgame. They did an end to the story. Not the end of the uh-huh. world. The world still exists. But that is the end of a 10-year arc. And, like, yeah. maybe Star Trek needs to start aiming towards that kind of stuff. Where, like, make some of these shows have some interesting crossover material, some interesting, like, Section 31 stuff that's mm-hmm. going on, and tell elements of the story maybe on different shows, crossover stuff. That's always exciting, like they did with the CW stuff. And then give me endings, you know? Give me character deaths. Give me, like, yeah. re- resolutions instead of uh, always continuing, continuing, continuing. But then again, I, I'm the guy who, like, you know, Rios had his big leaving of the show last season in Picard. And I was like, but I wanted more Rios, you know, like I, like, but yeah. I think that desire of wanting it's, it's the wanting rather than the having, you know, it's, it, yeah. it really does death hurts in a TV show. Cause you want more of that thing and it's over and it makes you, it makes it feel valuable. Those Rios episodes. I mean, thinking about it right now, I care more about those early Rios episodes now that he's gone. Like, I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I, if I want to see Rios, I am going to go turn on that first season and watch, like, all those versions of Rios holograms running around the ship, you know? Like, I, yeah. I, I can feel it in myself feeling um, sort of value to those episodes that I did not have yeah. before. Just like uh, Book's Death and Serenity gives a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, retconned meaning to uh, the Firefly. Yeah. Absolutely, a- a- all the deaths, all all the deaths on Serenity yeah. really yeah, give yeah, yeah. meaning to to those characters and make me passionately long for more of those characters and make me care about them on a rewatch more. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's maybe that's what we're saying. Really, is we need we need people to die. <laughs> well, we need intentionality of closure. You know, yeah, and that happens over time. We need directionality. We need intentionality. Like Voyager. Voyager's a good example of this. They were heading home. So even, and, 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 the, mm. and, and T- DS9 the same way, there's the Dominion War. You know, it's like mm. the Dominion were mentioned in the first season. And then they sort of like slowly drip them in. And then it becomes this big thing. Um, yep. What's the first uh, Alpha Quadrant or Al- Alpha Beta Quadrant race to encounter the Dominion? I don't remember, man. Ferengi. <laughs> they, they think they can, uh, I think it's like Quark or the Nagus, like, find out about uh, the dominion and they're like oh maybe there's a whole bunch of people we can sell things to like that's the whole thing i it's do like, remember that episode i didn't yeah. realize it was the first one yeah first mention of the dominion it's like that's cool. in the first season and then like they slowly drip it in and it becomes this war and it's like the the directionality of the prophets and cisco as the emissary and like mm-hmm. all that stuff um as much as but but still being episodic and fun to watch but driving towards a bigger, like bigger themes and arcs. And I guess we kind of have that with Pike and his trying to understand his own mortality Mm -hmm. um, in the, in this very interesting way. It does. uh, It does serve to rob us of a certain amount of stakes between that being a prequel and between knowing and knowing like what exactly what his fate is and him, him knowing what his fate is. But I mean, whatever there's, there are plenty of other stakes. Yeah. And I guess zooming out with discovery, we have, the sort of reestablishing of the Federation is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Su- and that's my favorite part, honestly. Like that's some of my favorite stuff is like seeing those little drips of like how they advance, you know, how their, how their story yeah. is advancing as the episodic stuff is happening. Mm-hmm. On, on this episode, uh, I thought it was interesting that Chapel is giving Spock relationship advice and knows about to bring because in TOS, it looked like when he has said, to bring is my wife. Chapel looked shocked. Like she was like, <gasps> "Yeah, I remember." That. You know? <laughs> I remember that. Um, I wonder. Yeah, I mean, you can head it all day. It sounds like that was just not not supposed to be the way it went. Is that she knew about? Yeah, it. and I, I'm assuming probably in this show. Wait, his wife? Does he say his wife in in the show or they're betrothed? I thought right. I think he says his wife on TOS. Oh, okay. I thought they were betrothed. And they were supposed to get married, and then she employs instead of wedding, she wants battle or whatever. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it could work differently. It, could, it might work, you know. Wife and betrothed is the same thing in Vulcan. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, 
or maybe they're just betrothed and he says wife. So it's another instance of TOS not being, you know, canon with itself. Well, he I said mean, wife go- for shock factor. Well, it's the same episode. <laughs> so then it goes on. They go on to. Yeah, so it's like, I know. <laughs> it's, I don't know that it's a like canon. The, he said my wife. And then they come back from commercial. He's like, well, we're engaged. Yeah, exactly. That's like <laughs> that really is what happens. Like that's that's weird. <laughs> that's just, it's like they did that just to get that reaction from Chapel. Uh-huh. And maybe that's the yeah. thing. Maybe like to head canon it. Like he's like she's like, wait, that happened already. What? How did we not know this? You know what I mean? Like I am shocked. It's been like ten years. How are you not? Yeah, but I thought you just like y'all just called it off or something. <laughs> By the way, I I will say this, and I can't believe I haven't said this before uh, in the episode, in this episode. Um, I am officially, and I didn't think this would happen. I am officially now. I like Nurse Ch- this version of Nurse Chapel more than the original series. Oh wow, that's huge. That is huge for me. That like, is really Spock, huge for you. Spock still still mean well all the way. But wow, that's huge, dude. That's a big, that's a big, I do really like this nurse chapel and this episode with nurse chapel and Ortega, like we got these little duos this episode. I mean, um, obviously to pring and Spock switching bodies is, mm-hmm. and, and them working as a team to fulfill each other's things. <laughs> I, I thought that was, good. I wish there'd been a little more communication between them. Like, yeah. you know, uh, hit your communicator and ask questions or something like there. It, it, mm-hmm. it seems a little weird. They send them in opposite directions. Well, you, anyone who's been in a long-term relationship knows you have to work together to fill each other's things. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it's a team effort. Um, I'm Dave, and I'm 12. <laughs> um, and then you get uh, Ortega and Chapel. Uh, and is it just me? or She mentions she's bisexual, correct? Chapel? Yes. Because yes, she mentions the she, female, she, she, had she a mentions fling. the lady that she had a fling with, and then she mentions we meet, we see her on the date with dude, the dude. I, I, I mean, like they maybe they're just friends, but I definitely got vibes of Ortega and her maybe having like a little bit of a connection. Yeah, I didn't see that really so far. Oh, I, I did. just ca- I just call it their friends. Regardless, I enjoyed them a lot. That last moment when they're sitting on the couch together or something, and they're like, "There's just some looks between them," and I was like, mm, "There might be something brewing I mean, there, maybe." But I don't, I don't see it. But Maybe I'm wrong, and but also uh, the thing I'm excited about is uh, someone said that, uh, that how they should have mentioned uh, Roger Corby, and and that little like list of people that she had dated, because Roger Corby is who she like followed into. And that's why she went to Starfleet in the first place. That's the that's the dude from What Are Little Girls Made Of, uh, who turns out that he died and transferred his brain over to an android body, but that was like Chapel's great love. That was her fiance. Hmm. And uh, Akiva Goldsman commented on Twitter and said, stand by. So we're going to get some Corby, some Roger Corby. <laughs> nice. <laughs> some, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That's not as exciting for you, I guess. No, nope, I don't know. I don't know that episode. So no, uh, but yeah, that's cool. I, I like, I like the uh, using canon to build this world out. I dig that a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other, of course, we, we talked about a little bit, but Una and La'an. They're, and they're the other duo. So it was like these three yeah. duos kind of traipsing around the ship, all sort of doing hijinks, uh, dating hijinks, body switch hijinks, and, you know, a, a, like classic sort of like uh, senior officers trying to get in on what the, uh, you know, enlisted are doing or whatever. I was, um, I was talking to somebody on Twitter, and I don't know that they're a listener, and they didn't say it was um, specifically for feedback or anything, so I won't say their name. But it was someone I, I talked to on Twitter, and they were complaining about one that there was chewing gum because <laughs> we've never <laughs> seen chewing gum on Star Trek, apparently. Really? That Which feels... I thought we had. I d- didn't we see that in like some kind of baseball centric thing on DS Nine? Yeah, I feel like maybe somebody was like, they you chewing just gum." Chewed. I want to say like maybe Worf was like, "You ju- just you just chew it." Like he was like weirded yeah. out by it. I want I want to say there was like a reference to it when they were like the like the baseball card episode where Jake was trying to get that card or whatever for his dad. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then maybe there was like maybe, you know, take me out to the Hollow Suite they were talking about. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Take me out to the Hollow Suite. I I didn't do any research. I don't know, but it it you know, if if the original Enterprise has signs on the bridge that say no smoking on the bridge, 
we can have chewing gum in Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the other thing he was complaining about was Christmas, like because they said it's like Christmas. And I was like, well, you know, right now, Christmas is already like, what, 70% pagan holiday? If, even if you're like, we're not supposed to have religion in the future. Well, on, in the original series, they had a chapel and not just a nurse chapel. They had a chapel <laughs> where Kirk married a couple of crew members. And also they had a ho- they had a Christmas party. Yeah. On Dagger of the Mind. Isn't Pike Christian? Didn't he talk about his faith in a... Yeah discovery a good bit yeah some version of it yeah yeah they're they're they may be mostly men of science and have given up religion in the, f- in the future but there are still people that have faith in the future too like I, that's yeah. a weird one i guess that's one of those things i would love to explore as a writer on star trek like how does how does that exist in in this future you know sure sure yeah but i you know one of my favorite things was always the prophets absolutely and ds9 in general just with like yeah yeah, resolving um, how uh, Kira interacts with the the crew and how she interacts with the few the, this version of the yep. Federation and stuff, and and believe mm-hmm. so strongly in her uh, prophets, but at the same time, her prophets were real, very real, and actually encountering them through the orb. So it's like, yeah, that they're real. <laughs> yeah. It's just like yeah. uh, her her religion ended up just being like a hundred percent true, like maybe yeah. not the same. We see it in a different context. They're the wormhole aliens, but like mm-hmm. for her, th- that the stuff she believed was true. You know, it's it's very it's just uh yeah. Hmm. I always thought it was a missed opportunity that they didn't encounter that uh, the Enterprise never encountered a a planet where they had like statues of Q. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they were like worshiping Q. Yeah. <laughs> and Picard's just pissed. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> well, uh overall, I just think it's a good episode. I, I didn't yeah. mind it. There's I feel like there's not a lot. I mean, th- I feel like maybe you have some things that maybe you connect with us to the original series, which you've done a little bit, but I've done a little bit. Um I mean there's some stuff, you know, they they Spot brings up his uh say lot, which was from Journey to Babel in the original series, and then we actually saw the say lot in the animated series. Um, you know, they oh, they brought up um, because um, what's her face to Pring is working with the that guy from the Vitash Couture, which is like the the Vulcan movement where they don't believe that logic is like 100% the way or whatever, or they do, they they follow logic, but they're they have emotions, they you know, they kind of veer away from the teachings of Surak. And, um, which I guess Cybok would have been a part of, but that was from Enterprise, not the original series. Mm. Um, the Vitash Couture, uh, I rem- label anyway. That's right. I remember them. Uh, they were like doing some terrorism, right? In Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing some terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I stand by it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, I, I don't know. Like, they, we did some, um, they, they referenced a private little war because Mbenga had been, had, uh, spent time studying Vulcan medicine. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, they kind of hit back on that. I mean, see, uh, they mentioned the girl that Christine, Chapel data was on our Ar- Argelius or Jellius, whatever it was, too, which was from Enterprise Wolf in the oh, sorry, TOS uh, Wolf in the Fold. Yeah. Um, yeah. I yeah. mean, they, they they definitely hit back some uh, some stuff from the original series. Yeah. And we we do have some some feedback if you want to hit oh, that yeah. up real quick. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Timothy Castillo says, uh, Dave, to whom I continually, uh, to whom I listen to continually. Matt, he he who is my most prevalent podcast host. The expectation of Star Trek that I have held within me has not been met by many of the attempts taken to create new and exciting episodes. The last episode was, in a word, fascinating. You guys, fellas, caballeros, monsoir. <laughs> Spock, Spock could be a different Vulcan. The Enterprise could be a different ship. Pike could be a different captain, etc. Ad infinum, I don't care. This last episode is the Star Trek I've been waiting for since Picard said he should have done this a long time ago. And Cisco decided to jump off of a cliff. I was annoyed at the last two seasons of Disco being one or two episodes crammed into an entire season. 
Picard being very much the same thing, drawing everything out so unnecessarily uh, for little to no payoff. Uh, I still enjoyed them, but they do not invite a rewatch. This, ep this episode may certainly have elements to quibble over, as any episode possibly could, but this one and Memento Mori have been golden highlights for me uh, of what new Trek should really be striving for. One could argue, and I indeed and indeed be correct, that it was just a silly Freaky Friday rehash, but damn it, Dave, he assumes... <laughs> He assumes that that's what I'm doing. <laughs> he assumes. I'm not doing that. I actually, you know what? I really liked the fact that they like so quickly uh, told Pike what was going on. You know, they didn't spend the whole episode yeah, trying to pretend. Same. The, there were, that saved the premise for me. Right. Yeah. While there were hijinks, they weren't like yeah. keeping it a secret. I think that's like a big thing that I think we're just tired of that trope. I think that's one of the reasons Marvel yeah. got rid of secret identities. Like just hiding it from your friends and family is just not funny uh -huh. or fun. It's a lot of like fake drama. Yeah. Yeah. I hate it. Uh, but damn it, Dave, I'm a fan, not a critic. I love it. <laughs> oh, this no, series. he's just he's just referencing uh, McCoy. I, know there. What he's I, doing. I got you. I got you. I know what he's doing, but still, it seems <laughs> like he was singling me out. Yeah. <laughs> I feel attacked, Timothy. Uh, I love this series so much more than any other new hour long live action series yet. Well, this isn't an hour long. <laughs> this is like 30 minutes at this point. Um <laughs> I hope that this bodes well for the rest of Trek's future. Peace and long life. Uh, and then he says, P.S. I am an idiot, so I included a poor quality recording of myself reading the first paragraph, doing my own half-baked impression of Spock. It's for you, Dave. I know you love people trying to be Spock and or Vulcan and failing. Dude, actually, I thought it was pretty good. Like, I won't play it because you said it was just for me, but I thought it was pretty damn good. It was, it was almost as good as, as Ethan Peck. Mm. Like you're, you're on some par, dude. You could play any other Vulcan, just not Spock. <laughs> <laughs> but I would have told Tim. I would have told uh, Ethan Peck the same thing. <laughs> Thanks, Timothy. I, I, I dig that. That feedback was great. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that he brings up so many of the themes that we've actually talked about on this episode that seemed yeah. like they were, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, rabbit trails or whatever. Um, uh -huh. like, but it's, it's, it's really true that I think this show is hitting on this sort of like rewatchability, uh, that yeah. Star Trek hasn't really had lately. And that I, I think, uh, yeah, I think this is a, this is a show that, uh, Star Trek, uh, Star Trek is, I think going to be a little more indelible, even if just cause it's that much more rewatchable, you know? Yeah. I dig that. I agree with that. Good thoughts, Timothy. Yeah. Um, Stu, Stu Little, um, and this is from last week. Or the last episode as well. I have learned from the past, from past mistakes, to include the name of Stu's uh, subject line. So he named this one Gorn Hub. <laughs> <laughs> I just got that. Sadly, I think it was. I think it was hearing it out loud. I got it. I like. Uh, I saw that title in the email, and I was like, Gorn uh -huh. Hub. Was there a hub in this episode? Like, I was like. That was more uh -huh. of a Gorn ship, but okay. I, I get it now. Sorry, yeah. Stu. Sorry for being so thick. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like something that you should say. Like, like uh, don't apologize for being thick. It's Gorn Hub. Everybody's thick on Gorn Hub. <laughs> you know? Like, that's that's the trending kink, you know? Mm. Thing. Oh, okay. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> authenticity. Oh, is it authenticity? I don't know. I think you might be uh, revealing too much about what the algorithm serving you up there, buddy. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't. I I don't go to there. That's a bad place. <laughs> I have no interest. My burgeoning asexuality, you know. Mm, burgeoning asexuality is that like yeah is that like an age thing or is that just yeah uh, <laughs> that's, it's exactly the, an age thing it is exactly an age thing i'm just um i'm getting old and i'm like ah i've seen all that i don't care about that shit and by that i mean that. gorn hub i mean gorn hub gorn you know? hub yeah it's like kirk in in arena i am uh as most humans naturally repulsed by lizards <laughs> by reptilians you know <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Stu Little. <laughs> what does Stu Little's Gorn Hub have to say? He says, hey, guys. That was it. No. Um, well, I've enjoyed every episode of the show so far, but I think this was the strongest yet. The Enterprise getting rocked and the crew having to play a game of cat and mouse with a superior force while also dealing with various other crises happening on board made for an eventful but pretty well-balanced episode. I really liked the unexpectedly more subtle depiction of the Gorn as they're being built up in a way that feels like how the Reavers were done on Firefly and a bit like how early TNG tried to make the Ferengi kind of mysterious and threatening. Some other thoughts. What kind of hair products does Spike does, does Pike use that keeps his uh, his in place even as the climate controls are on the fritz? Um, I would say the same uh, hair products that Riker used on Generations when the entire ship crashed into a planet and his <laughs> hair was still perfect. <laughs> By the way, it's funny. Spock seemed to be sweating the most considering he comes from a hot planet. I really think sci-fi shows should avoid using plasma as a word for blood because it creates momentary confusion with the other meaning of it being a state of matter. Even if technically, yes, a plasma conduit could refer to a blood vein too. No, I'm good. <laughs> I wasn't confused. <laughs> I wasn't confused. I, I really, I really like that. I'm definitely, next time the doctor has to stick me, I'm going to be like, uh, can you find a plasma conduit, sir? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know what they stick. <laughs> I know that it's sort of out of character for a Federation helmsman, but Ortega's nervous interjections are pretty funny. Why is that blip so much bigger? Didn't our science expert just say that it would crush the ship? Just asking, sir. Uh, Stu, I'm glad you're digging it, dude. I don't care for it. Yeah, I, don't I gotta, like, I gotta I don't say, like Ortega's. <laughs> I gotta say, I, I thought about your criticism of that last week uh -huh. uh, of that line, and I disagree with you because I think it's her being funny. Which is like, uh -huh. you, you know, she knows what it means. She's yeah. just panicking. She's like, uh, there's a big, why is, the, why is there a bigger one? You know, like, why is it bigger? Yeah. What does it mean that it's bigger? Like, she doesn't want to believe it. It's that like same sort of disbelief yeah. that any character That's like that what I was that saying is like, yeah, either she is horribly incompetent or she's just super obnoxious. Either way, I don't dig it. I find it funny. I like her so far. Yeah. And this episode uh, particularly, her teaming up with Chapel was a lot of fun. Yeah, makes sense that you would find obnoxiousness funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm friends with you. I mean, you're friends with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like how, yeah. I like how you heard that. I got to the joke you set me up for, and uh -huh. then and then you had to rush to try to beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You, you, you said it with no delivery, just speed, because you're like, "Oh no, he got there. Let me take this one." <laughs> that, is, that is that is like yeah. we, we often joke about being volleyball funny, where you like uh -huh. set someone up for the joke and then you spike it, right? Uh, yeah, that is the worst version of that. <laughs> That's my favorite version of that. You like set me up for the joke and then you sp tried to spike it on me. <laughs> no, that's my favorite version of that. I like when people do that with me uh, because it's, it's, it's a feeling of camaraderie. Yeah. <laughs> it's like share a shared laugh, you know? Uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, Stu says, don't touch the stove, Uhura. Because cause Hammer told her it's hot. And she's like, oh, we'll touch it anyway. anyway uh -huh. Given how creepy he looked as a hallucination, did anyone else think it was going to turn out La'an's brother actually went psycho and killed her family crew? And she just suppressed it by remembering it as the Gorn instead. I could have seen Ooh. him tying into her feelings about her ancestry if she thought he was like that because of his genes. Honestly, I thought that's where they were going for a minute. Because really? he did look creepy. He did look creepy. He looked like a little real killing piece of shit he definitely had like the just stoic ghost face that like you know stoic stoic ghost boy <laughs> he had that, that little creepy smile that front you know like that guy from lie to me you remember that guy the red-headed guy from lie to me i he's don't remember got, that guy but i love that like, i love that show he's always got that creepy little face like the like the main character on lie to me always has like this little like, creepy smile like he always looks like he's like smiling while bearing into your soul. Tim Roth? That's not Tim Roth. He's the main character on Lie to Me. Oh, maybe I'm just mixing him up with somebody else. Thinking Who, of who's show, another maybe? guy? I'm thinking of another show. Yeah, Lie not to Me was the guy. Tim Roth show where he's like a lie was... expert. And I was I was like, 
I don't know what you're talking about. Lie to me is awesome, and Tim Roth is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Tim Roth. Uh, That's maybe uh, my least favorite canceled, like cancellation. I loved that show, and I think I was the only one, which is why I got canceled. But like, uh-huh. I just love Tim Roth, and so him on a show, I was gonna watch it. But and then it's really, really good. It's a really good show. Yeah, it's all pseudoscience BS, probably, but I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> so are all the other shows about catching criminals on TV. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that aren't done as well. Pretty much. Yeah, so um I don't know. I it's hard to type in creepy guy with a little small T V <laughs> show and get like an accurate representation of what you're thinking of. You know, I appreciate the effort though, Dave. I yeah, really no, do. I really there's do. There's a there's a red headed guy, he's on like th- crime thrillers and shit, and he has a little creepy smile. And he's just annoying. And women think he's really hot. And I don't get it. All right. Um Anyway, <laughs> maybe I'll update on the show. I'll figure it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Please, please bring us an update on that. There are a lot, a lot of people out here wanting yeah, to know. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Stu says an obvious elephant in the room is the notion that there's not much tension in plans that could threaten the ship's destruction. Not just because it's a prequel, but also because of Pike's knowledge of his own future that can't happen if he dies in the present. However, they get around that by emphasizing that even in surviving, they lost seven crew members and Pike still cares about those kinds of losses. Mm-hmm. There's, there's still personal stakes like that, and that's enough for me. And with Same. several of the main cast being completely new characters, there's tension with them. Nothing guaranteed that Hammer would survive the vacuum attempt just because a hero would. Strange New Worlds being able to give most of the characters something to do in the plot makes it increasingly difficult to accept Discovery's tendency to not do that. Even the transporter guy got a moment. Next thing you know, we'll see him start to date an Irish botanist. That's it for me. Take care, guys. And then he brings back in a and he comes back as it says in a post called Gorn Addendum, uh, Gorn Hub Addendum. <laughs> I forgot to ask in the previous email if a Gorn got assimilated, what would you call the new thing? A Gorg, a Born? You just call it a Borg. You just call it a Borg, Stu. Mm. That individuality is erased. Mm. All, all the technological and biological distinctiveness uh-huh. will become their own of course as we know q said they don't care about the crew they just want the technology back in their first true. appearance so Very true maybe maybe at this point in history they don't they don't care about you know the crew maybe they wouldn't yeah. be assimilating back more. then of course that doesn't make any sense since they captured no. seven as a child but <laughs> that's right uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, Seven's not 200 years old or 100 years old. No, 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 no. But Seven's childhood, I think, I think, was before that line in uh, TNG, my point. Maybe. Then again, maybe Q was just, just was not up on things. Yeah, that seems like Q. <laughs> he was just like, well, the last I checked, they were just a bunch of assholes going around stealing technology. Oh, no. Okay. Never mind. That was. Uh, nope. They're. <laughs> Sorry. Never I'm- mind. They've changed. And then he like blinks away and blinks back and he's like, okay, I just lived a couple years among the collective. They are dark now. (laughs) 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 Things went dark over there real fast. Oh my God. (laughs) It's it's like some Cronenberg body horror happening over on the board (laughs) side. You guys may want to stick steer clear. Never. I'm sorry. I threw your ship here. There's a bitch over there that's just shoulders and a spine. <laughs> Good merciful Christ. That was a Yep, now you're just wanting me nor to a Norm McDonald as Q. I, I, I do. I do want <laughs> that. Would, that would have been a wonderful Q. John that Delancey would. is wonderful, but Norm McDonald would have been a wonderful yeah. Q. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um so Stu says, as for Spock Amok, very entertaining episode, it'll be at a missed opportunity. To have some dialogue where Spock says, I am familiar with Freak Friday, Nurse Chapel. <laughs> Is Freak Friday another uh, thing that they do among the ensigns? <laughs> I would hope. <laughs> My God, I hope. Like casual Friday, you know? Uh-huh. Um, like every Friday, you just get your, you, you tweak your freak. Yeah, I, you got understand it. whatever tweaks your freak, man. Um, My favorite joke this episode uh, was Spock uh, saying, she says, what are friends for? And he goes, hmm, what are friends for? 
Like in, in a great delivery of that joke, just a really great delivery of that joke. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then she says, Oh no, Spock, it was a rhetorical. And he says, I know <laughs> humans are almost as easy to tease as Vulcans. <laughs> it's really good. Yes. Which is really great because it was something that I, uh, I was talking to you about last week. I think basically they did a retcon in episode two of Star Trek, the original series where it was like in the cage, Spock is a laughing fool or he's just, you know, grinning and shit. And then in episode two, Talon Kirk, he's like, ah, yes. One of your earth emotions, you know, like Mm he's, he's pulling our chains, man. He's pulling like, (laughs) like Spock's been screwing with the, with with humans for all these years. Yeah. So part of the, uh, part of the aesthetic of Spock that we all think about and we're like, and people talk about like, ah, Vulcans don't laugh. Vulcans don't do this. Part right. of it is that he's the only Vulcan and he's kind of cheeky. And he like is, uh, yeah. he's playing with the crew when they make jokes and he pretends not to understand. He's really like just poking at them. I like that uh-huh. retcon a lot. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not even really, uh, it's like, like I said, it's like original series from, ep- from number one to number two. Well, yeah, but the cage retcon. was technically not canon for a long time. I don't know if it, I no, guess like it is a now. long time. Not a long time. It was like a few episodes until they didn't have the money to spend on f- two full episodes. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it was like this first season. I guess I don't know how much of the cage exactly was used in the... Most of it. <laughs> it most of it? Okay. <laughs> but even even like in Mud's Women, though, while like the, all the cr- male crew members are falling over all the, these uh, women that uh, Mud has and just staring at him and stuff, like... Spock is leaning against a bulkhead, just like smiling, just smirking at them like mm-hmm. foolish humans. Yeah. Like he's definitely got like a sense of humor. Oh, even yeah. if he like slowly tries to be like, no, I'm going to suppress that. I am Vulcan. Yeah. That ends up going away as soon as he like abandons the culinaire, culinary discipline in TMP. Cause like then when we get back to him in the, in the wrath of Khan, he's, lying and shit he's still being vulcan but he's it's a slow progression for him throughout like um slowly become more uh go from not controlling it as much to con- trying really hard to control it and then back to being like ah logic is bullshit the beginning of understanding not the end valeris yeah 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 and you know i <laughs> You know, this is actually a problem. I, this is stupid. This is me being stupid. Uh, but uh, Freaky Friday episodes, sometimes I have an issue where, like, I have a trouble tracking who's who in the moment. Because uh-huh. I almost said, I, I was, like, sitting here thinking, I wish he had gotten to interact more with the character from that faction of Vulcans that doesn't follow logic. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, wait, he was the one that interacted with, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I really, yeah. like, the whole episode, I'm sitting there going, like, Wait, who just said that? Right. Spock's in her. He's in, uh, you know, like Spock is in her. She's in Spock. And I kept having to like go back and forth. (laughs) Like, oh, wait, that's just stupidity on my part. Like not being able to track it. (laughs) Yeah, I did that a little bit too. Yeah. I'm I'm bad about that stuff too. That's why I don't like Freaky Friday episodes because I'm not very bright. Yeah, I was going to say that earlier (laughs) about myself. I was like, that's my problem with them is like I have a hard time following sometimes. They're confusing. I don't like them. Yeah, it's like like Spock, but it's not Spock. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The Vitash Couture, by the way, sounds like a name brand. To me, it sounds like an evil organization. At Vitash Couture, we're bringing you (laughs) quality of life through virtual augmentation. So I, uh, so I, I am, I'm glad they interacted, but I kind of wish they discussed logic a little bit. Like I'd like to see Spock sort of struggle with logic, be a little more, a def- little more like well-defined and like d- just, just a little more like episodically discussed, I guess. Like the, well, I, I like think- the ideas behind the Vitash Couture and to Pring's ideas that things need to be a little more Vulcan in his life, like his decor. Yeah. It's in there for sure, but I want to yeah. see him struggling with it. I want to see him sort of like talk about it. I mean, he literally had a dream where she enacted the, uh, the challenge ritual, uh, Califi. Sure. Because he's not Vulcan enough. I agree, but that's not him. T- 
talking about why like his own like at this point his his thing is i want to be more vulcan i am more vulcan i want but i would i would be interesting to see like like if that vatash couture guy had been able to like question question the idea of devoting yourself to logic in an interesting way and had spock be able to respond to it or not respond to it and be like well that, that's an interesting point you have using logic you've trapped me into this idea that my f- seeking of logic is a little illogical i don't know like i I'd, I'd love those kinds of discussions but it was just instead it was just like hey yeah. go bring this guy in and he's gonna try to persecute you a little bit as a half human, you know? Yeah. And then of course, you know, Spock comes to the conclusion that there is no such thing as real logic, but do it, you know, uh, cleverly. So it's a metaphor for Canon. (laughs) (laughs) Like the real Star Trek fan has to come to the idea that there is no real Canon. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Just watch it. And, uh, you know, feel hopeful for the future yeah that nothing will ever matter (laughs) you need to go watch you know everywhere all at once sorry i know that that's one of those things where it's um (laughs) i've kind of been like sometimes i struggle with uh existentialism yeah (laughs) and uh one of the things that kind of pulls me back a little bit is jerry seinfeld is an exist existentialist but he says, why does everyone always say that's a bad thing? That's perfect. That's great. Nothing matters. <laughs> Do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, indeed. Indeed. I, do you want to go see everything everywhere all at once today? Oh, gosh. I'm down. Um, I'm down to I don't go know. again. I don't know. Let me, let, let me speak with my consort. Yes. Speak with your consort. And I am down to go today if you want to go uh we'll see it's it's uh yeah it's just i do want to see it <sighs> it's just great uh go uh-huh. see it everybody everybody go see that movie it is i think i'm gonna do a binger's assemble about it because i just think it's <laughs> one of the best things i've ever seen everybody see it everywhere all at once yes please <laughs> all right guys uh i wish that had happened because I, I really want that movie to be successful i wish they'd had like a killer opening because man yeah. it's, it's so good meanwhile i'm laughing at the morbius situation what did did you see that? No, I I think I saw something about it, but I didn't follow through and look into it. Uh, basically, because Morbius Morbius was trending so heavily on social media, uh, Sony for some reason decided that they should re-release it in theaters, and <laughs> they they didn't realize that Morbius was trending because it was a meme. That's so silly. How do you not? It was being made that? fun of, and so they released it, and it and it bombed horribly. It made like eighty five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> wow and and i just uh it's like sony once again we must remind you that social media is not real life like <laughs> well it's like social media is not real life and also it's a meme it's, it's not. a meme like the context is important to these things we're like making you can, fun of it yeah trending because you're making fun that doesn't mean there's like a big clamor now if you had steered into it and mm-hmm. put out like the morbius cut with like like, if they had re-released Morbius in theaters with the Mystery Science Theater 3000 guys over the top of it, yeah, that might have done really well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that might have done really well. But Maybe. That, yeah, no, that's not what the thing is. That's not why everyone's excited. Um, and I, I don't hate Morbius like everyone else does. I really don't. Yeah. But I've heard that. Jason uh, didn't like He didn't dislike it. I, I don't think film. it's bad. I think it's... in. T- attempts to connect to the MCU are bonkers and it misses some real character moments that were really obvious. And it almost feels like mm-hmm. it's, it almost feels like they intentionally edited out character moments. Cause there's a couple character moments that they, they head towards and then they just mm-hmm. cut away. And then it goes to after that moment. And it's like, it's almost like they filmed something, didn't like it and then cut it. And instead of refilming mm-hmm. it, they just had him say what happened after the fact. And it just feels like what, what, what in the world? Um, so there's just a few weirdnesses like that, but mo- for the most part, it's pretty good. Um, yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, uh, I guess it's about time to get out of here. Yeah, man. We have, this may be the, one of our longest episodes. <laughs> we, dude, we chased some squirrels this episode. <laughs> for real. I was like, let's stick to things and do, try to do a quick one. Cause I got a lot to edit tonight and now I have a lot more to edit. <laughs> just, you know, yeah. don't post it. Oh uh, yeah, I may post it tomorrow. <laughs> Just don't, don't post, post it, it man. At all. <laughs> yeah, this is this is for us. 
That's true. That's true. This is a relationship building tactic. It Our is. numbers don't meet out that we're doing this for an audience. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's true. It's true. <laughs> this is, it's very true. This is a uh, very much yeah. a reason to hang out with my buddy Dave. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know why they don't listen? Because we spent 30 minutes talking about Star Wars. <laughs> Somebody tuned in and was like, did I click on the wrong show? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, welcome to the Star Trek universe. The podcast talks about Star Trek. Anyway, so Star Wars. So how's that Obi-Wan <laughs> treating you? <laughs> it's like it's like we're a Star Trek show that doesn't know what the difference. I don't know, but I like that Bill Burr thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, anyway. it, it was fun chatting with you, bud. I'll yeah, talk man. to you soon. Jolan True. Live long and prosper. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 